Welcome back to the second uh, part of the first lecture of experimental vibration analysis, where we will talk about dynamic uh, systems. Now, there are two theories particularly interesting to explain, explain dynamic systems. And the first one is Laplace transform, the second one the Fourier transform. The Laplace transform I is kind of a black box theory for linear, non -lin for linear systems. Uh, it is used to solve any linear differential equation and it's rather a mathematical tool without no, uh, any direct physical interpretation of the S-plane. The Fourier transform, on the other hand, uh, is a dire directly physically interpretable transform. Uh, but it has the slight drawback sometimes that it only gives the steady state solution. We will get back to this later. Now, the linear systems theory I want to talk about, and which I write about in the book, uh, is a theory which is very general uh, and used for to explain the output of a linear system. So, in the book and during this course, we will typically have input signals x of t that go through some linear system h of, uh, described by h of t uh, and forming a, an output y of t. From linear systems theory we then know that the output time signal can be written as the convolution integral of x of u h of t minus u du which is x of t convoluted by h of t. Now I will not explain the convolution in this video but I have a separate video that I recommend you to watch if you are not fully familiar with the convolution integral. So, the other way of computing the output is to take the Laplace transform. Then we have that the Laplace transform y of s uh, is equal to the Laplace transform x of s times the function h of s, which is the Laplace transform of h of t, and which we call the transfer function. We can also use the Fourier transform, and then we obtain that the spectrum y of f equals the spectrum x of f times the function h of f, which is the Fourier transform of the uh, impulse response. And it's not the same as h of s here, even if it looks like it perhaps here. But I'm using uh, this, you should not be confused that I use the same function description. But when it's s or when it's f, it's completely different functions. Okay, we call h of t the impulse response. The function h of s is the transfer function. And the function h of f is the frequency response function. Or, simply speaking, frf. This is a very common function that we will use throughout this course. Now, if you understand convolution, you will also realize that the impulse response function acts as a weighting function for old input values. So the impulse response describes how much of old input values will be taken into account to produce the output value. So what is a linear system really? Well, it's a system that is described by linear differential equations. But that perhaps doesn't say very much of what to expect from such a system, or even how we can know we have such a system. So another way of describing it is that if we have an input signal x1, which produces an output signal y1, and we have another input signal x2, which produces uh, an output signal y2, then the sum of the two input signals, x1 plus x2, should produce the sum of the output signals, y1 plus y2. This is also called superposi superposition, of course. And if this is valid, or if the system is linear, superposition works. Another implication of a linear system is that if x of t is a sign, then y of t is also a sign, at least after the initial transient has died out, so in what we call in steady state. 
So how do we investigate this? How do we investigate if a system is linear experimentally? Well, the way to do it for mechanical systems is that we measure the frequency response function using several different levels of input signal or even several different input signals of different type. And if they all produce the same frequency response function, then the system is linear. Now we will go through the Fourier transform in some detail. Uh, first of all, we should say that the Fourier transform comes out of the Laplace transform uh, in such a way that if we have a Laplace transform expression, we replace S, the Laplace operator, by J omega, being J times 2 pi times the frequency in Hertz. The Fourier transform uses all time data from minus infinity to plus infinity to transform a signal into a steady state spectrum. So the formula is that the spectrum x of f, the Fourier transform of x of t, is computed as the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of the time signal x of t multiplied by e to minus j 2 pi f t dt. And there is also a backward or inverse transform which computes the time signal x of t by the integral from minus infinity to infinity of x of f times e to j 2 pi f t df. Note that I there is a plus sign in the exponent for the inverse transform, whereas there is a minus sign in the exponent for the forward transform. The uh, Fourier transform is a linear transform. This means that the Fourier transform of the sum a1x1 of t plus a2x2 of t, where a1 and a2 are scalar constants and x1 and x2 are time-dependent functions. This Fourier transform equals a1 times the Fourier transform of x1 plus a2 times the Fourier transform of x2. Next, we should observe that the Fourier transform actually consists of two integrals because e to j omega t or e to j v is cosine v plus j times sine v. So using this rule, the uh, Fourier transform x of f, which is the Fourier transform of x of t, is an integral x of t times cosine 2 pi f t dt minus j times the integral of x of t times sine 2 pi f t dt. So the real time of the Fourier transform comes from the time signal which is transformed times a cosine. And the imaginary part with negative sign comes from the time signal multiplied by sine. And of course what happens here is that we use the orthogonality of cosines and sines to pick out whatever is similar to the cosine in x of t. But we will look at that more in more detail in a later uh, chapter. Right now we will just say that it picks out the part of x of t which is not orthogonal to the cosine or sine of interest. Next, we should talk about even and odd properties of signals. As you probably remember from math classes, all signals can be split into a sum of an even and an odd function. An even function is a function xe for which xe of minus t is equal to xe of plus t. You see such a function illustrated here. xo is an odd function because x o of minus or x sub o of minus t equals minus x sub o of t plus t. And it's easy to validate that x of e, uh, the even part x e sub e of t can be produced from any signal x of t by taking one half times x of t plus x of minus t. And the odd part 
x sub o can be constructed by taking one half of x of t minus x of minus t. If you do that, it's relatively easy to show that x of t is the sum of xe plus xo. And it's also easy to show that xe is an even function and xo is an odd function. Now using these product, uh, properties and also some additional uh, rules that you probably remember that a product of an even and an, an, an odd function is an odd function and a product of two even or two odd functions is an even function. And then also you should remember that a symmetrical integral of an odd function is zero, of course. So to sum this up, even times even is even, odd times odd is even, even times odd is odd, and odd times even is odd. Now, if we use this and apply to the Fourier transform, then we have that because cosine is an even function and sine is an odd function, it follows that if x of t is a real valued signal, which in our case it always is, then the real part of the Fourier transform x of f will be the even part of x of t, x e of t, times cosine, because the other part, x o, times cosine, will integrate to zero. And similarly, the imaginary part of x of f is x sub o, the odd part of x of t, times sine of 2 pi f t, and integrated dt. So, the real part is the Fourier transform of the even part of the time signal, and the imaginary part of the Fourier transform is the Fourier transform of the odd part of the time signal. And it's also true that the real part of the Fourier transform is also an even function, and the imaginary part of the Fourier transform is an odd function. So these are some very important aspects or results, characteristics, if you want, of the Fourier transform. Next, there is a table in the book, table 2.2, .2, which I want to point at. I'm not going through it here, but you should go through it and make sure that you understand all these Fourier transform pairs. And if possible, you could go back to your Fourier class, or the class where you covered the Fourier transform, and make sure that you remember all these properties of the Fourier transform. Here, I want to conclude by discussing the uh, concepts of transient versus steady state conditions. Now, the output of a linear system, due to a sudden input, which means that you turn the input on at a specific time, which we normally call t equals zero. The output of a linear system, due to this sudden input, is the sum of a transient part and a steady state part where the steady state part is the part remaining after the transient has died out. As you know, the Laplace transform results in both the transient and steady state solutions. But the Fourier transform, if you use the Fourier transform uh, to produce the output by taking the input Fourier transform times the frequency response function, then this solution only gives you the steady state spectrum. This sometimes leads to a misunderstanding. So I want to stress that experimentally we can use the Fourier transform to produce an FRF, which we will do in chapter 13. Then when we have the frequency response function, we can take the inverse Fourier transform and obtain the impulse response. And having this impulse response, we can use the convolution integral to produce the total output solution for any input, including the transient part. So the fact that we use the Fourier transform to produce the frequency response function does not mean that we can only obtain steady state solutions on the output. It's only if we use the product of x of f times h of f that we only get the steady state spectrum y of f. 
This concludes the current lecture. Now you can go to the book and read the uh, relevant chapter and uh, work through the examples at the end of the uh, chapter. Then you should also go to the chapter examples in the Abravibe toolbox and read through these and run them and make sure that you understand all the steps involved. If you haven't yet downloaded the toolbox, you sh should do so at www.abravibe.com. Welcome back to the next lecture when you have worked through this.